Coming up next, your chance to pose your questions to your governor. From the governor's mansion in Cheyenne, this is Wyoming Perspectives, a conversation with Governor Matt Mead. Hello, I'm Richard Ager, and welcome to our Wyoming Perspectives, our conversation with Governor Matt Mead. During the next hour, we're going to ask you, our viewers, to send, you, send us your questions. Uh, you can call them in at 1-800-495-9788 or submit questions via Twitter at hashmark YOPBSGov. And Governor Mead, thank you so much for letting us join you in this case. You are on home turf after all. Well, thank you, Richard. It's nice to have you back. It's been about a year, I think, uh, since Almost. we were here. And uh, nice to be with you. So thanks for having me on. Well, thank you. Well, you know, uh, to get to what's been going on, because it's beginning a busy time, as, as we all know. Earlier this week, you took your uh, budget proposal uh, to the legislature's Joint Appropriations Committee. And you called for cuts, but also some new spending. So I thought we'd get into some of the details on, on some of that. Very good. Uh, you want to increase the gas tax, which hasn't been increased in, I believe, 14 years. Obviously, during that time, the cost of asphalt and other elements of road construction have gone up. And you'd like long-term funding for long-term planning. So yes. who could possibly object? Well, uh, we've, we've heard a lot of objections. And, uh, you know, as a taxpayer, I think everyone should be naturally their first inclination to be object to any new tax. But the point I make on gas tax is this, is we do need a long-term predictable funding stream because one side of it is the money. The other side is the predictability of the money. Because for DOT to do long-range planning rather than a year or six months, uh, they need to know what money they're going to have for what projects. And on top of that, the contractors themselves, you know, what are we going to need in terms of labor? What are we going to need in terms of equipment? What is our planning? Fourteen years ago, we raised the fuel tax. Since then, the buying power has uh, decreased 60 percent. My first session in office, I asked the legislature to take one half of one percent of the severance tax, divide that into thirds, and have one third of it go as a dedicated funding source to roads. That would have been about $50 million at the time. They rejected that. Uh, the second year, uh, toll roads were looked at. They rejected that. So if you don't have one or the other, uh, where else are you going to look? So again, in this year, I asked in the budget a long-term funding stream, the fuel tax. And I said, if you don't give me the fuel tax, give me an equivalent amount of severance tax so it's a dedicated funding source. And I think this is going to be a hot debate in the legislature. There's no question about it. But I would point out that, you know, in terms of tax, if it's 10 cents, Wyoming uh, citizens pay about half of it. And so when I drive in Colorado and I pay more fuel taxes, the question is how much do I want to subsidize out-of-state drivers when they, they drive in Wyoming? Because they pay less to drive on our roads than we do to drive in theirs. So uh, one or the other, but I think we have to make a decision. We have kicked this can down the road so many years. And the fact is every year you try to grab it out of the general fund, you know, you're not putting it in education, you're not putting it in health care, you're not putting it in community colleges, you're, you're putting it somewhere else and it's not predictable. So I think it's a legitimate debate for us to have and like I said, let's get it decided this year. Well, the road has to be there to kick the can down, right? So. Oh, that road has to be there to get the kick, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And, you well, know, do you think some of the objections are, are more politically oriented rather than just on the sheer economics of it? Because it is a user pay scheme when you have gas tax paying for highways. It is a user pay scheme. I mean, in terms of taxes, it's as close as you can get to, you know, you pay as you go. That's so how would you characterize the, the objections that are coming Well, in? I think it's, you know, I think it's a normal objection. Nobody wants to pay more in taxes. I understand that. But, mm -hmm. and that's why the education is important for us to explain where we are, because there's a limited amount of money. Uh, you can't just keep grabbing out of the general fund. And if you do that, you're taking it away from somewhere else. So, you know, ultimately the question comes, do you want less education dollars? Uh, do you want less health care dollars? Uh, do you want less uh, for the game of fish? These are the decisions we have to make. There's not an infinity fund there. And so we need to do it. And on top of that, it is not fiscally responsible to not maintain a road. Because if you don't pay the dollar this year, you're going to pay four or eight dollars down the road. So I think it's fiscally responsible always to maintain those roads at a high level. It's a safety issue. It's a commerce issue. 
and we need good roads in this big rural state we love. Well, you think it's going to be a hard fight, though? Well, I think, it's, I think it probably will be a hard fight, and I don't think that's uh, illegitimate. I mean, it's any time you're going to talk about raising taxes or talk about severance tax, uh, we need a healthy debate on it. But I think I have made the case for, uh, for the need for it. Uh, we'll see if anybody else agrees with me. Well, um, you're also proposing some changes in actually how the uh, state saves its money and keeps its books. Uh, the Permanent Mineral Trust Fund, which can't be touched, will get less, and the Rainy Day Fund will get more. Right. And you also want to count capital gains income as income. Yeah. It sort of reflects a bit of the national debate as well here. What's your thinking on this? Well, you know, the, one of the reasons I so much appreciate you being here tonight is these, these are hard to explain in sound bites because it's a little bit complex, but we basically have two funds we're looking at, the permanent fund, as you mentioned, and then the rainy day fund. And just starting out, if you talk to investment fund managers, about half of them will say you've got to be in long term, and the other half say short term because we have so much turmoil now in the economy. So just in terms of investment strategy, I think it's debatable where it's best to put more money. But for the last two years, you know, I've heard a lot of people in the legislature say we've got to build up that rainy day to $3 billion, which is roughly what it would take to run state government for, for two years. And I have generally uh, been resistant to that. But now as I look at the fiscal cliff, as I look at the loss of AML funds, mm -hmm. as I look at $60 million for fires, as I look at uncertain fuel prices, what I don't want to do is, you know, have government grow based upon, oh, we're up a little bit, and then call and say, cut 10%. I mean, we don't want to send that message out. It causes turmoil amongst the agency, and more importantly, the citizens are wondering, what are you doing? I, you're, you're cutting the 8%, and then we next read in the headlines, you got $300 million extra. And so I want to smooth that out. I want to provide some predictability and transparency to the process. And on top of that, in building uh, the, the rainy day account, I want to look at how much money we're spending on school CAPCON. If my budget is, is uh, accepted, we will have $600 million for the next five years to build schools, which is a lot of money. Uh, and rather than just adding more to that, uh, we would take some of that and build up savings because I think it's a very good time to have savings that can be liquid if uncertainty hits us. And uh, I think as I look at the deficit and debt of the federal government, I think there's a lot of uncertainty out there. Well, and also, you know, you, you can't ever forget that this is one of the few states that actually has the luxury of making those kinds of choices. Yeah, yeah. Oh, let's build up the rainy day fund instead of that fund. Those aren't choices being heard in every state capital. No, it's, it's true. I mean, we, we, it's sort of a, a nice debate to have is wh where do you want your savings? Uh, how do you want to fund government? And I think, you know, and just talking to a few legislators, you know, one of the things we could look at in the future is rather than building our budget on what we're predicting, is let's actually build the budget on what we have. And, you know, the use of the rainy day fund, building the rainy day fund will allow us some of those opportunities. Now, there's a budget question which also uh, goes over into the um, um, health area. And I, I'm going to go to the um, first uh, 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 question from one of our viewers. Uh, and this is from a Vicki McFarlane, and her question is this. Our adult daughter has an acquired brain injury and has been on the ABI uh, waiver list for 18 months. She has a six-year-old child, and according to the guidelines, she's not supposed to have to wait this long, but in reality, many have been on this list for over four years. People are suffering, their families are struggling to help. When will Wyoming come to their aid? The waiver was supposed to help Wyoming citizens better than Medicaid, but our daughter is in limbo, and it's a nightmare for her and her family. Yeah, well, it's a great question, and of course, uh, we have sympathy for her and families in a similar situation. Uh, the waiver list, uh, ABI, Acquired Brain Injury, or DD, mm -hmm. uh, we, and compared to other it's states... Predominantly disabled. Yeah. Yep, uh, disabled. Um, we, uh, compared to other states, do almost better than any other state, if not better than any other state. But one of the problems we have in our system is we've designed it so it's sort of an all or nothing proposition. In other words, you're either in, completely in with every mm -hmm. service, or you're out. And Director Forslund at the Department of Health and I have said we want to reduce this waiting list exactly for the reasons stated in the question. Uh, we recognize there's people out there who are not having their needs met. Because in fact, they're all equally entitled under the law, right. Abbott, but because of waivers, there's not always enough funds. There's not always enough funds. And I supported the $1.5 million addition uh, last year to uh, try to lessen that waiver list. But it was Although, for, to be fair, of course, you wanted originally to eliminate it 
And well, then, no, I'm talking about last year. Last year. Last, last, last year. year. Uh, I, I didn't. Uh, I, I was for it, but the problem was it's one-year funding. And mm -hmm. so this year, because if you can't do one-year funding, because once you put it in, then you're automatically in for the years to come. And so the legislature has to make that decision. But what Director Forslund's working on with me is he has had people who are getting the waiver system who say, you know, we don't need all that you're providing. In other words, you're wasting some of your funds on us. And so he's going to develop a two-tiered program and he believes that if it's done appropriately, that we can significantly reduce or even eliminate the, the waiting list. And that is a laudable goal in my mind. Now, not everyone is going to be getting all the services, but we'll be able to serve more people. And that's the goal that uh, I want to reach, is how do we get more people off the waiting list and getting the services they need. Well, I know in your budget uh, proposal, which we just presented, you did say you want to provide help to all those who need help without necessarily spending more. I'm wondering, what's going to be, do you think, the winning argument when you go before the legislature and all the committees to, to rearrange how the Department of Health would, would administer those programs? Well, I think that uh, one is uh, Director Forslund, I think, has got a lot of credibility with the legislature because he has taken the Department of Health apart in terms of examining everything. And he recognizes there are some areas where we are not spending what we need to and there's some areas where we're spending more than we need to and so in, in meeting with everyone from preschool folks uh, to those who have concerns about ABI to the DD waiver list we've said listen w please work with us in terms of how do we design these programs to maximize the effect and maximize the dollars that we have and so I know I'm not going to just get there on, on my charm uh, in terms <laughs> of your question but I think that we've got a very good discussion uh, with Director Forslund Tied into that, of course, is the whole issue of Medicaid, Medicaid expansion, the ACA, how we address that situation. I think we may touch on that in well, a little I bit. Well, I won't preempt <laughs> you. <laughs> you know, uh, just staying on the budget for, for the moment, yeah. um, another area, you're not actually cutting any of the funding for nursing education, uh, which led to a, a larger question in my mind. How do we keep more of the uh, educated graduates of our s educational system that we spend so much on once we they do go through? Well, I think, you know, one of the, look at a couple of programs we have, WAMI at University of Wyoming and Wichita to help uh, medical students. Uh, I'm a believer in that program. And so the university, at, you know, as they were doing what they supposed to, they recommended cuts in those areas, and I didn't recommend cuts. And the same with nursing, is because I do have a belief that if you can get a good education in Wyoming in the field that you're interested in, the likelihood is you uh, are more than likely to stay around in Wyoming. On top of that, uh, uh, those medical providers, nurses, physicians, uh, you know, there's going to be a shortage. There already is a big challenge for nurses. So it didn't seem to me to be uh, wise, it seemed, you know, penny wise, pound foolish to start cutting education in areas where we really need some additional people. And so we went through it with a fine tooth comb and, and had to make those decisions. And, and that is what you have to do in order to, you know, make the presentation. We didn't just take 8% off the top or 6% off the top. We looked at each individual program and tried to make the best decision we could. You know, not long ago, we actually uh, devoted a couple of programs to uh, health care and particularly access to rural health care in what is obviously a rural state. And I'm wondering, um, are there measures or possibly further measures that you think the state could take to um, increase the accessibility to rural health care to those areas of the state where they're two, maybe three hours from a doctor's office and yeah. just it takes an entire day to get a single appointment done? Well, I, I do think there's things that uh, we can do. One is I, I think the future telemedicine uh, can be a very important component uh, to Wyoming and to Wyoming citizens. Uh, there, that we're building on that. Uh, we've got a long ways to go. I'm not saying that's the answer today, but that should continue to be a target is what we could do more with regard to telemedicine. On top of that, um, you know, we have uh, allowed for some money for medical homes. I think medical home, the scheme or the design behind medical homes is a good one that I think reaches metropolitan as, as well as rural areas. But I'll tell you just today, you know, I, I wrote a, a letter uh, uh, to uh, back to Washington, D.C., and I said, Please understand, we are the 10th largest state geographically, uh, but we are smallest in terms of population. 
And so the, sort of the cookie cutter approach on how we address uh, health care doesn't work. I mean, it doesn't, we're not the same as uh, Texas or California. We have additional challenges because of, of our population versus the size of our state. And so uh, we are unique, but I do think that telemedicine, uh, medical homes, and providing some greater opportunities for the Department of Health with some of our young physicians and nurses coming up uh, can be, meet some of those needs. Uh, another, and I would say just in terms of the budget, a potential challenge coming up uh, for the budget, and that is uh, you've already set aside uh, another $60 million for wildfires, figuring we could have another bad season uh, coming up. Uh, one of the causes that many say uh, of, of the wildfires was the extreme drought that we were in. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I'm wondering, you know, so far there's not all that much precipitation going on. We could be revisited by the drought. I'm wondering, you know, as we look to the dilemma that many ranchers have faced over the past year, and I know you have a ranching background yourself, so you would know about this, do you think that the state may end up being forced to step in a little bit more to provide some kind of aid, assistance, or what have you, to, to what they face? Well, I, that is a distinct possibility. Just on the fires, uh, you know this, but to give the context of this, uh, you know, this summer we burned up over half a million acres. Uh, we uh, collectively with the federal government, we spent over $100 million fighting fires. And so my request for $60 million for fires is to replenish the pot and then prepare even for a worse fire season next year. Because you look at long range uh, weather forecasts, that's uh, sort of where you have to be. Uh, we tried to uh, help uh, ag in a couple of ways. One, on oversized loads, because there was a lot of hay coming in, needed mm -hmm. to come in from out of state, uh, and we were trying to make sure our ports and our highway patrol recognized the, the critical situation. I was with the stock growers this week, and I think I've got mixed reviews on how well we did on that, <laughs> uh, but that was one of the attempts. And we also are looking with state lands now, because one of the areas that uh, we are concerned about and I think is going to have to we're going to have to look at in terms of funding is reclamation because in some of these areas the fires are so big and so hot uh, that we're going to have severe erosion problems and all that goes with that and the loss of any vegetation that may be left the pollution of creeks and streams and uh, we're trying to figure out how we can step in on some of the reclamation but ag is critical to Wyoming not only because it's our third largest industry but because it provides so much of the quality of life that we love here in Wyoming. So I am amenable to you know, what we can do to meet uh, some of the short-term disaster needs of those in ag. And you know, entwined in all that, of course, is the whole question of water rights and how that's going to play out. You know, obviously we have a system where um, if you got here first, you're probably in better shape than most other people, but that even that didn't help a lot of ranchers this time around because there wasn't any water in a lot of the creeks. I'm wondering, do you think we're going to be revisiting if this drought and whatever other effects of climate change come upon us, uh, that we're going to be engaged in a much more concrete debate over water rights over the next few years? Well, I, you know, when I campaigned, and, and I, I firmly believe this, you know, it's water is one of the resources we don't talk enough about. Mm -hmm. it, you know, we love uh, the oil and gas and coal. But our most precious resource outside of our people is certainly water, because if you don't have water, uh, you don't have mineral development. If you don't have water, you don't have community development, economic development. And one of the concerns we have, uh, we have great water law in Wyoming. Elwood Mead set us up very nicely. I think our water law in Wyoming is as good as anywhere if, if it's not the very best. But one of the challenges we have, for example, in Green River, we have rights to water we're not using. And, you know, they're going down to the Colorado River. The best protection in terms of water is the use, uh, beneficial use of water. And I am challenging those in the state uh, who, uh, who work on water for me. Let's find projects, whether it is storage or something else for industry or for ag because we've got to find ways to protect our water. And you saw probably just in the paper, you know, the discussion of the Colorado River and what it's going to look like in 20 or 50 years. We're part of that compact, and the lower basin states are also the ones with population. And I worry at some point, you know, population uh, translates into political clout. Well, and so we make it we clear, have yeah. to be very proactive in protecting our water because in Wyoming and the West, uh, no water, uh, you've got a very bad situation. Much more to come on that one. Yeah. Um, you're recommending $5 million 
for the uh, Microsoft's new data center in, in Cheyenne. Um, phase one would involve 17 jobs. Simple math tells you that's about $300,000 a job. Uh, you're expecting further return? Yeah, we were recommend finding a million dollars to replenish some of the money that we used uh, for the data centers. Uh, I am, uh, you know, it's I, I push on technology in a big way. One of the reasons we just talked about is telemedicine, but it goes mm -hmm. to teleeducation, telecommuting. I think that Wyoming, as we list our main industries, uh, you know, uh, minerals, tourism, and ag, I think we have a real opportunity to start talking about tech as number four uh, because we have a favorable climate. We have great energy that can be provided at low cost, and we have people that are interested in diversifying, and it adds to the diversity. So, so who are we competing with who has those attributes? In terms well, what of other all states of, would we Well, be? we, you know, when, uh, for example, when Microsoft first announced mm -hmm. it, we know that they were looking at several other states, including some to the south of us, and so Rocky Mountain State, certainly, but even uh, Midwest states and Eastern states, uh, they're competing for that. But we have, you know, because of our location where we are in the country, because we have been building fiber out through the state, and I've been focused on that, uh, I think we have some great opportunities. And so uh, if you look long range over 20 years in terms of what it means back to the state of Wyoming, it makes economic sense to me just on the dollar amount. But beyond that, it makes better sense because it helps start diversifying our economy. It gives our young people uh, another opportunity to stay in Wyoming because there's another big career field out there for them. One, it's a fairly small budget item, but it really caught my eye because you're also uh, proposing spending uh, 250000 on simplifying state rules and statutes. So to put it simply, is there just too much gobbledygook on the books? There's too much gobbledygook. I, don't, <laughs> I couldn't say it better. I didn't say it that way. We have. Uh, Are there, I mean, do any glaring examples come to you mind? You know, yeah. I have uh, in my office. I have my chief counsel, and one of her jobs is to look at rules and regulations. And she spends hours and hours and week looking at new regulations that are coming in through the agencies or the commissions that we have. We have about 18,000 rules and regulations in the state, and they grow every day. I think today I signed three new ones. And people don't understand, they say, well, why'd you sign that? I don't like it. I can't just ignore them. I have limited reasons to reject rules once they hit my desk. And they have to be, because they, they conflict with statute, they conflict with another rule. But they're just growing, they're just growing. And we don't have any process to say, what are we doing? Can't you just put too many already? <laughs> well, I would love to put too many already, but the problem is, it's, it's, we worry about conflict in the rules, yeah. I worry about that, but I also worry, we want somebody to be able to come to Wyoming and say, you know, I want to start a business. Uh, where do I look? And here's the rules, here's the regulations, I know that. I don't have to know that there's another whole library with rules that I have to go through. The state of Utah did this recently. Uh, they hired, I think, two grad students. They looked at it, and they significantly reduced their rules and regulations, which, when you do that, it not only simplifies the process, but it makes the rules and regulations you have more relevant, more meaningful. Well, you know, I just, I, I, for those who study American history, you have President Jimmy Carter tried this with his famous Paperwork Reduction Act back during uh, his uh, time in the White House, and it didn't seem to really work, actually. The, as you know, the federal tax code kind of grew even after that, et cetera. So um, I would say it would probably take an eagle eye on this one. Yeah, well, I, it will. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, the legislature often says, you know, here's the statute and the agencies to promulgate rules and regulations accordance. Mm -hmm. and, th and that's proper because you know, they can't stay in town year-round, thank goodness, for them <laughs> and for me, uh, to, to, to know where that is. But we have to recognize that as we grow and grow and grow, there is that necessary conflict, and it makes us less business friendly. To our viewers, if you have a question for Governor Mead, you can call it in to 1-800-495-9788 or send it via Twitter to hashmark YOPBS gov. And I think that what I'd like to do is go to another question. This is another email from uh, Jason Dixon. Uh, it's got partly to do with um, social policy and partly to do with health. And it's about medical marijuana. And he says, Dear Governor, so it starts nicely, uh, even back in 2002, two-thirds of Wyoming citizens were for medical marijuana. New polls show that support has grown. How do Wyoming politicians feel they're fulfilling the will of the people by going in the face of such poll results? Do you not feel that plants and flowers are created by God? Well, I, I guess to start with the first part of that, I, I think that's uh, plants and flowers uh, created by God, uh, that's fine, but 
uh, you know, there's a lot of plants and flowers out there that we wouldn't necessarily want to consume. Uh, I'm thinking of cactus, but uh, it, okay. I, I don't think that's the question. I think the question okay. is, is it a legitimate use uh, for medical purposes? And the fact is there are synthetic forms of THC, which is the active ingredient in mar uh, marijuana that uh, helps everything from you know, glaucoma patients to those who are uh, going through cancer treatments. That is, we have those, and those are prescribed and they are regulated. You're now, referring to cannabinol among other yes, uh, medicines, uh, yes. but uh, all of the research I've read looking into this shows that they may help some, but there are many that they don't help. Well, and I'm, I'm sure that is true. I'm sure they don't help everyone. But the fact is, uh, when we look at one of the major drug problems in this country today, uh, it is certainly illegal substances, but legal substances more so than illegal substances. So when you say medical marijuana, and if you go down to the dispensary and you pick up whatever bag, who has, who's done that? Who's grown that? What is in it? What is the THC count? What are you actually getting? What is the side effects in terms of your lungs, your gums, all of that? And to me, uh, that is not where Wyoming wants to go. Now we see well, we're well, Colorado, Colorado, of course, has see, the recent experience. And yeah, and, and um, my former life as a U.S. attorney, you know, we, we spent a lot of time on this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just saw today in the news one of the officers I used to work with down in Colorado was talking about, you know, just the new wave, which is it's legal. And there's great concern about that. I mean, the fact is in Wyoming, we still aren't doing as well as we should with regard to uh, controlled substance, with regard to alcohol abuse. But to his central point, though, which is that two thirds would just as soon take the, you could say, more libertarian approach and say, if you want to do this for your health, mm -hmm. why should I stand in your way? Well, I think uh, I'm not sure where the two thirds came from. I, I haven't was, seen um, that. But from a poll, which he was uh, the Lucas Organization poll. But e even, even if it's two-thirds or even if it's a larger amount, I still think one of the responsibilities for state government is to, uh, even if it may not be popular, uh, to make those decisions we think mm -hmm. is in, in the best interest of the citizens. And for me, uh, medical marijuana is not a substitute for the other medicines we have that are highly regulated, uh, highly studied, you know what you're getting when it's dispensed. And even with that, uh, you know, drug overdose from legal substances, uh, meaning prescribed substances, is mm -hmm. a huge problem and a growing problem in, this, in the state and the country. Of course, um, our neighboring state to the south has now gone one step further and legalized marijuana flat out. Um, that's shaping itself out right now. We'll see what happens, but do you see any repercussions or complications for our state? I mean, do you foresee any need for our highway to patrol to set up roadblocks or, I don't know, anything like that? Well, we'll have to see on that. I mean, just by proximity, I think it's legitimate to say, hey, you know, this could cause problems in Wyoming. I, I, I think, you know, 12, 13 miles from here, we have the Colorado border. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that is going to be a challenge for us. But in terms of additional law enforcement, you know, one of the things that the Highway Patrol does very well is interdiction and stops. Um, I mean, that's how a lot of big drug cases are already built in Wyoming is through the good work of the Highway Patrol. But we'll see. And then I think on top of that, we have to see this is, you know, the fact is it's against federal law. And we'll watch what, uh, as we used to say, Mother Justice does or doesn't do with regard to the enforcement. With regard to medical marijuana, you know, they sort of turned a blind eye on that. We'll see what they do with the uh, Colorado and is it uh, Washington, I believe, the state of Washington. So. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Ben Franklin once said, nothing is certain but death and taxes, and I think we should all add healthcare debate to that list. Uh, so first, I'd like to start about the, the question of the health insurance exchanges. Right. Um, the deadline for submitting a plan, well, the new deadline, uh, is tomorrow. Uh, you've already stated we'll, we'll have a federal exchange at some point in the new year and you're looking for I believe hundred thousand dollars in your budget request to look into what's best for for Wyoming I believe yes. for some research. Now that was despite the legislature blocking off any funds in one of its final acts in, in the uh, session earlier this year. Why did you, the legislature, Wyoming government, wait so long um, the, the Health Care Act itself passed back in 2010, and it's been federal law. I'm, I'm wondering, because now we're kind of up against it. Yeah. 
Well, it's been interesting because uh, right after I came in office, uh, they had actually, uh, the previous administration already set up a team to look at these exchanges. And just for the viewers, you know, it's go alone as a state, join another state, or let the federal government. That's sort of the general, overall generalized uh, view of it, uh, the three options. And so we were working on that for about a year, and at the same time, we had Healthy Frontiers come in. And then when the lawsuit got closer and closer, I think the legislature was concerned they didn't want us to jump into an area, that means me, uh, where they weren't ready to go. And so frankly, you had uh, the lawsuit, uh, you had election coming up, and the question was is how much time and money do we want to spend when this all may be for naught. Was now, that helpful at all though? I mean, well, when they stepped in no, and I mean, I, I tried to take it out of your hands? I, I think, you know, we're left somewhat, now, I have some criticism of the federal government in, regarding Medicaid mm. expansion because I don't think they've answered all the questions. We'll get to that. Now on this part <laughs> though, I mean, we're, we're not without some blame here ourselves. We haven't looked at, at this in term, we haven't spent the last year looking at it seriously and which is the best option for us. Well, you try, had hearings going. I attended we, a couple we, of them. We did. We and then did. they stopped in late February They or did March? because, you know, the legislature said no more funding. Uh, we we mm -hmm. tried to learn all we can, but they did stop. And so now we're in a position where uh, we are not prepared to say we're going to have a state exchange. But in the time that we did look at it, we did look at joining other states. Uh, no other states were really, uh, we were sort of the wallflower at the dance, sort of, because of our small and relatively not as healthy population as some other populations. But where we are, which is that uh, tomorrow is the new deadline, and I'm writing a letter saying we're not going to meet that deadline, so in fact, it looks like we're going to have federal change. It's not necessarily bad news, because I said, all things being equal, I'd much rather have it state run, but when we are being told to do it, we don't know what the costs associated, we don't know what all the rules and regulations. It's not all bad to say, feds, you know, you run it for a year, we're going to see how this looks, and then we can change our mind next year or the year after, after we get a feel for what you're doing, what the rules actually are that are promulgated and finalized, and then we can make the decision. So. It's not, it's not like, oh, now we're just stuck with this. It's, you know, this may very well have been the choice we made anyway had we spent the last year working on it. You know, uh, we have a, a, a question from a, a viewer in Lander regarding health insurance exchanges. And here it is. How will this affect the self-employed? Um, our viewer has a family of four. Cost of insurance is now $10,000 a year with a $10,000 deductible. It says Obamacare has helped the family for the first time college-age students can stay on insurance, premiums have not increased for the first time, and refunds, I got $1,400 from that 80-20 rule where insurance companies uh, had to spend at least 80% of their uh, premiums on actual care. And it also covers uh, health care screenings for the first time. So this uh, obviously sounds like a person who's definitely in favor of the provisions, the chief provisions of Obamacare, what do you say? Well, I'd say first of all, uh, Obamacare is not going to be fully implemented until 2014. Uh, I just read a report today that Aetna, which is one of the country's largest insurance companies, predicting with regard to individuals and small businesses that insurance premiums may increase by 100%. Uh, the work that we have done in Wyoming, uh, once it's fully implemented, is that it could go up, insurance premiums could go up 40 to 60 percent. And, you know, some say that's initial and then it'll drop off. But understand when you're providing, trying to provide more care to more people, there's no magic formula. I mean, there's going to be costs associated with it. And there is a cost associated with it. Uh, but in fairness, you know, we also are a state right now that the hospital association says, uh, combined, we have about $200 million in uncompensated care. That's paid for too. Uh, the hospitals just don't need it. That is passed on. And so the theory on uh, Obamacare is that if you get more people insured, uh, that that helps offset some of that cost and it doesn't raise insurance premium. But when you look at what CBO says, what you look at what Aetna says, what you look at what we find out in Wyoming, it's all over the map in terms of is there gonna be a savings or is there gonna be extreme cost? I lean towards, I don't see how you do all this without a lot of costs associated with it. And I think that's going to be the case. Well, just uh, to remind our viewers, if you have a question for Governor Mead, call it in at 1-800-495-9788 or send it via Twitter, Twitter, excuse me, at hashmark YOPBSGov. Uh, obviously, the healthcare debate extends into um, the potential extension of Medicaid to what it turns out to be the, the poorest population, um, I'm 
I know you're, you're familiar with the new report from the State Department of, of Health, which states that if we don't extend Medicaid, and this is a quote, the uninsured truly in poverty will most likely remain uninsured. And if that remains the case, then that same report predicts that there will be more than 100 additional deaths within five years due to the lack of health care. Given everything that you know, um, what's, what grounds are you deciding this on? Because there's economic grounds, there's obviously moral grounds, humanitarian well, grounds. Just so I'm clear, are you talking about Wyoming Department of Health? Wyoming Department yeah. of Health, yeah. Well, I mean, Which also found that if you extend it, you can actually save money. Yeah, just, just for background, uh, of course, the Department of Health doesn't operate without, you know, in the discussion with me. And that is exactly what I asked them to do. I want you to look at every way it will affect us if we do the expansion and every way it will affect us to the best you can if we don't do the expansion, including the costs associated with, not just the economic costs, but in terms of, of health costs, what you just mentioned there. And I would point out that uh, with regard to the expansion, the people who are already in poverty now, and this is a little overstated, you know, 100% are below poverty, they are eligible for Medicaid. We're talking about a population between 100 and 138 percent. And from Forsland's uh, discussions that I've had with him, the people that are most likely going to be left out in the cold is what he refers to as the working poor. In other words, it's not people who are trying to game the system. It's a, a single mom or a single dad uh, who are working and they are, they're making too much to get Medicaid, but they're not making enough in order to pro get private insurance. And I think that is legitimate. If we do not do the expansion, those people are at risk uh, in terms of getting Medicaid. Now, if we do not do the expansion, though, there is Plan B from the federal government. And Plan B is uh, they will subsidize, subsidize insurance from anybody who's making 100 up to 250 percent of the poverty level. They will subsidize so that they can buy private insurance. That is not going to be foolproof. Uh, the expansion is not going to be foolproof. There will be, still be cracks. But either one of those uh, is going to, there's going to be a cost associated, but either one of those that we do will certainly provide more insurance uh, to more people than we have now, uh, but there will be a cost. Well, um, as, as you were mentioning with, with this report and uh, Tom Forsland, he, he concludes that uh, purely as a finan on a financial basis, the coverage of both mandatory and the optional um, groups is a better budgetary choice for the general fund. Yeah, and I, you know, now, I, is that going to be powerful ammunition? Do you think? I, I mean, well, I think it's legitimate. I mean, that's that's one of the reasons I asked him to do the report. Is we, this is not a, something we decide based upon a political gut reaction. Sure. We have to do this analysis, and that's why I said I want you to submit your budget as if we're going to do full expansion. I'm going to reject that because we need to bring this to a head. We need to have all the numbers out there. And he spent a good portion of his time yesterday in front of the JC presenting that exact report. And I think the legislature is going to have him present it to the legislature as a whole because we have to be educated on it. And what the point he makes is that for Wyoming, because of the Medicaid program we have right now covers so many people, there will be tremendous offsets to the tune, I think it's $70 million in five or six years. There will actually be a savings to the state of Wyoming. That's compared to Kaiser, which says it'll cost the state $90 million. My belief is part of that discrepancy, which is it going to save us 70 or cost us 90, is because they haven't, uh, you know, vetted out all the rules yet. We don't quite know what the rules. But this is exactly what we ought to be discussing. Uh, the economic costs, what is it going to do to the health care of our citizens? And it is not a debate that is, a, a, you know, sort of a canned response. So, I'm for it or I'm against it. I mean, it. obviously this is of the moment right now where you're at. But yeah. Uh, you know, I know that the committee is now asking for more details, even though they have that report, you know, from the Department of Health. The, the JAC committee? Yes. Yeah. Uh, but from what I'm hearing you say here, your rejection at this stage is not because you're rejecting it flat out. You're saying, let's take it to the legislature and have this whole thing hashed out in great detail. Yeah. So that we can all then make a, 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 an informed decision. So I, I'm wondering, where are you really coming down on this? Well, I think right I think you just said that. I mean, well, you, the, well you're the, saying this you're rejecting it for now. This, yeah, I am saying absolute reject for now because okay. I have written now, uh, as of today, four letters to HHS to get direct answers to some of the questions we're talking about and the mm -hmm. rural challenges. This is not that something we should just step off and and say, well, 
you know, we like it or don't like it. It is a serious discussion, and that's why, you know, Governor Hickenlooper in Colorado and Democrat governors across the country, Republican governors across the country said, you know what, we're going to wait a year. <laughs> we're going to wait a year and just see what these rules and regulations are before we finally commit. The downside to that is you get you may lose the 100% reimbursement on the F map, but it only goes you know it steps down to you know 98, 96 percent, and never goes below 90 percent if if the federal government has the money to pay for it. So it is it is not. Uh, I mean I understand the public say make a decision. Well you know what if I make a decision I say we're going to do expansion. The first question you should ask me uh, sitting in the front of the fire other than what's the temperature currently <laughs> is how's it going to affect the people of Wyoming and what's the cost going to be. Well you know just to pick up on that point you just raised which is you know if the government federal government has the funds. I mean uh, range about a third to 40 percent of the state budget is made up of federal funds from some source. I mean we, we don't halt highway planning wondering are they going to send the 250 million you know for for the federal share of of highway construction uh why 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 apply that rule to to this well i i i mean i guess i'll disagree with you a little bit i mean in terms of the highway bill that is uh last couple of years been as a tenuous thing in terms of actually are they are they passing it what's it going to look like but you know we have medicaid now and they are providing medicaid dollars i get that uh, and so you can say, you know, there's no room for doubt the federal government's going to live up to their promises. Well, a couple things. One is w there's a fiscal cliff. The debt and deficit have been l larger now than they have ever been. Uh, we see them, t uh, you know, trying to take away our AML funds. Uh, we see them not immediately coming up and being able to li live up to their commitment in terms of buying land in Grand Teton National Park. I think that we're in a different world than we were two years ago, but certainly ten years ago in terms of where the federal government is. Uh, where are they going to get the money to do these things? And so I don't think you can dismiss a hand and say, geez, the federal government always lives up to their obligations because from where I'm sitting, <laughs> it's been a pretty tough year uh, just on AML funds. Mm -hmm. You know, speaking of the AML funds, do you, do you figure that uh, they're just uh, gone for good? I think that... Uh, I mean, we'll continue to get that lower yeah, amount. Right. But no, I, I, I'm not willing to concede that. Okay. Uh, I know uh, uh, Senator Enzi, Senator Barrasso, uh, Cynthia Lummis, are work having trouble getting their phone calls returned. Well, uh, that's uh, from another fellow reason. Republicans. Before we bite off on big federal <laughs> programs, we need to remember that. But uh, what I would say is, I think they're they're working very hard, and uh, I don't want to I don't want to concede until I hear from them that mm -hmm. the, there's no chance, and I've not heard that. Well, I mean, any regrets on how some of those funds were spent? I mean, uh, we cleaned up most of the mines already. Well, there's a DQ and so there was money spent on remodeling the UW Stadium and well, other uh, things. Well, just a clarification on that. You know, DEQ estimates there's uh, 250, I think 300 million dollars in additional mine reclamation that's needed. Uh, that's number one point. Number two, while the legislature appropriated AML funds for the AA, after they were out of town, I switched AML funds with other funds, so we aren't actually spending that. And the other point I'd make is, remember this, where do the AML funds come from? They come from the state of Wyoming and the businesses in the state of Wyoming. We have, as a state, the business in Wyoming, have put billions more than we've received. So it's not like we are taking uh, money away from other states. It is Wyoming that's funding it, and we're asking for the percentage back uh, that we were told we were going to get when the program started. Here's where being small can hurt, right? It, that's, that's correct, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you know, you had mentioned the, the, the fiscal cliff, uh, hopefully, knock on some kind of wood, uh, we'll have some resolution by the new year, yeah. but uh, I'm just wondering, um, how do you see that really affecting the, the current debate, uh, and I'll just uh, keep it to the, the, uh, the exchanges and the, well, actually, expansion of Medicaid, you feel that that could really weigh down on the legislature? I, I think it's, I think it's uh, you know, the legislature, I think by the time they're in town, we'll know, <laughs> I think, I think we'll know uh, whether we went off the fiscal cliff or not. Uh, but I think as we sit here in uh, mid-December and we're waiting for that, I think that adds to the uncertainty uh, just overall and the direction the federal government's going to go, uh, how that's going to impact every state. And because, and outside of even the question of health care, you know, how's it going to affect uh, our guard, how's it going to affect highways in the future. And mm -hmm. so 
And I think uncertainty in our decisions in government is, is a problem, but the bigger problem is for small businesses in Wyoming and basic businesses, that uncertainty, that instability is, is bad for business. Well, you know, enough controversy. Let's get to fracking. Oh, great. <laughs> we have a, a question for you, a Twitter question from Steph in Lander. What kind of feedback are you hearing on the review of industrial oversight of the oil and gas industry's hydraulic fracking? Um, I think, let's, uh, let's take out Pavilion for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, the, and, uh, I sit on the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission and uh, we hear uh, the request for permits, uh, we hear uh, concerns, and then of course DEQ uh, is an agency that uh, I named the director. I think that one of the things that uh, the previous commission and uh, Governor Friedenthal really had some vision on is the disclosure, uh, a, a disclosure procedure for hydraulic fracking fluids. That really set us apart and provided leadership and they're to be complimented for that. Because now as we're in this debate whether you need federal rules or not, it's very nice to me to say, listen, Wyoming is ahead of the game here, we're doing it. And so this year, uh, for example, in, uh, around Douglas, we had a well blowout. Uh, there was concerns of citizens there in terms of what does that do to my, my garden, my livestock, the health of myself and my kids. But on the fracking issue itself, you know, Pavilion is the area where everybody's been looking. And as you've watched that, uh, we see uh, the state of Wyoming and the federal government going through that. We're getting ready for the peer review process. But it's another one of those things. I understand that problem, but the people out there for a long time have not had very good tasting water. And whether you think fracking caused it or not caused it, we have know outside of that issue, when you drill on a gas field, you can have wells that are not tasting very good. So we have worked, I asked last session and again uh, this session, to help get a water solution out there. And uh, the citizens out there, you know, they're mixed in terms of their beliefs. Well, I think a lot of them were talking about wells that have gone bad that were good. What's that? A lot of them are complaining about wells that have gone bad, that were good. Yeah, and, it's, and, and we hear that, and we also hear from citizens mm -hmm. out there that quit talking about bad water, my mm -hmm. water's good and you're hurting the price of my land. Right. Uh, so it's, I think it's mixed in Pavilion, but all of them, I think, have an interest in having a good water supply mm -hmm. uh, outside of the fracking issue. You know, a month or so back, we actually did a program about uh, fracking and had uh, the head of the DEQ and, and the head of the uh, Oil and Gas Conservation Commission on, and we, we talked a little bit about, um, amidst all the, the complaints and the unresolved complaints of, of residents uh, in Pavilion, among other places, who say it's really hurt their lives, and, and one of the main things that they had to say was that their complaints would often bounce back and forth between the DEQ and the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. One would say, oh, that's their ballpark, and then the, they'd get the same answer at the other agency. And we talked about whether maybe this might be the time for an ombudsman in state government to listen to those complaints and do something about them. What do you think about that? Well, I think, I think, it's, I think it's a legitimate concern to citizens because you know, we're small enough that if somebody calls up, we shouldn't say call A and A says call B. But that's but, what happened though. Well, it, it does happen occasionally. And so one of the things that I started is we have uh, regular cabinet meetings with all cabinet members and then we have sub-cabinet meetings. And one of the sub-cabinets you know, has the DEQ, oil and gas, game and fish in there, so that we're not all pointing fingers with each other. But what happened in Converse County this uh, year, and some of the complaints of the citizens there is, you know, they would call up DEQ, and DEQ would say, well, you get caught oil and gas. So what I just, uh, since uh, the last couple of months I've been working on, is we need uh, uh, what I would call a rapid response team, where within X hours, in a mm -hmm. short period of time, uh, when something happens, we get out DEQ, uh, we get out oil and gas, uh, we get out any you know Department of Health, so that we're up there, not necessarily to answer questions of what happened, but to give out information, here's contact people, and here's the team uh, that you can call so that we're not, we don't have that situation. But in fairness, in fairness, I think the Oil and Gas Commission and DEQ, uh, John Cora, who just left, they do a very good job. I mean, they, they get up there, they have public meetings, uh, there's always going to be some who say we didn't do as well as you can, and there's always going to be examples where we can do better. Uh, but I think our state agencies have been very active in trying to address that. Well, to a completely different subject, and this is Patricia from Cody, 
And um, she asks, with the consent decree of 2003 passed by uh, Governor Friedenthal concerning the population of wild horses due to expire in 2013, will you support this? I guess renewing the consent decree. Well, we, uh, I'm not sure if that's what she means by consent, but I'll tell you what we are going to do, uh, and hopefully that clears it up, or I'm answering her question. Uh, the fact is, the, in the area of the state, there is too many wild horses. We don't feel like the federal government has lived up to what they have promised. We don't think the consent decree that they're going to agree to it. And I think what we're, uh, we're preparing for now is when that uh, ends in 2013, we're probably going to have to renew litigation. Uh, and that's what uh, got it started for Governor Friedenthal when uh, Attorney General Crank was in office. Uh, they began that process and, you know, in short order, got it settled and got a consent decree. And unfortunately, that looks like where we're probably going to have to head for now. Um, to the situation at the Department of Education, uh, as you know, it's in, in the headlines lately. The chair of the Senate Education Committee says it's in a shambles, and that's a view backed by a recent legislative report. Among the problems, high, still high school dropout rates more than 20 percent. Right now, the superintendent of um, public instruction is an elected position. Would you support making it a position appointed by the governor? Well, I want to I want to give a broad answer on that. Here, here's uh, as I look at my about two years in office, uh, we have a legislature that's very interested in accountability uh, because we spend a lot of money in education, and I'm proud of that fact. I think it's great, uh, but we want to make sure we're getting the results. Uh, we have me, a governor who's very interested in education, and we have a superintendent, but we're not all on the same page. And that's a fact. Uh, I have a belief, the legislature has a belief, and the superintendent has a belief. And you just saw, as you've mentioned, and that's sort of the tip of the iceberg of the squabbles and the angst and the disagreements, uh, you know, the different people have. And as we're asking for accountability to teachers, uh, we, meaning the government, <laughs> better get our act in gear, frankly, uh, because uh, if we can't provide predictable numbers in terms of what's going on out there in the world, it's, it's hard to tell the teachers who day in and day out come to work and do a good job that we're going to sort of manage the situation. And accountability now is going to be pushed back uh, because of this squabble. And for the teacher, for the parent and the student, they don't want to hear that we're having these battles. What they want to hear is we're doing a good job. And this is an area. I think the legislature is frustrated. I am very frustrated. And certainly the superintendent's frustrated. And now, as you see, they're trying to, that is, legislature says, well, uh, we don't like this uh, part, so we're going to give that to the governor's office or a governor's agency. I'm not going to take the Department of Education over piecemeal. The fact is, uh, you know, we either got to do this or we've got to do this. And I don't know where we are going to be uh, at the start of the session, but where I want to be at the end of the session is I don't want to be having to tell the voters we're still having our battles. Yeah, it is an elected position after all, superintendent of schools. Are there any constitutional barriers in the way? She, uh, she, she does have constitutional duties of mm -hmm. oversight of education and duties as defined by the legislature. Okay. The legislature is the driver in terms of her duties. Now, she has other constitutional duties on boards that she sits on, but in terms of her duties, the legislature has the ability, uh, without changing the Constitution, to significantly change uh, the roles that she, she takes on. And so, uh, as you saw last session, there was going to be a constitutional change. That didn't go through. And I think, you know, that's fair. I mean, the voters voted her in. I don't think you can change sort of midstream the, the Constitution to do that. But in terms of the work product that we need collectively, all of us, superintendent, myself, and the legislature, we need to, to get our job done. We're, we're, we're not getting there. And we've well, wasted, cool. fa frankly, uh, with this squabbling. Um, if the legislature says, uh, uh, or the citizens say, you guys haven't done a great job this year collectively, I think they'd be right. Well, one of our viewers actually had mentioned in an email the, his concern that the uh, superintendent would not have the same approach and philosophy as the governor, thereby setting up, you know, a yeah, conflict that, that there. The conflict. Yeah. Um, to the dropout rate itself, which is obviously a serious issue, what would you say to proposals to raise the dropout age to 18? Yeah, well, I'm interested in that, and, uh, and, uh, but as I talk to teachers, uh, they talk about some of the practical problems in having somebody who's 17 in your class who doesn't want to be there. Well, you have to set up alternate. Yeah, you're, you're, you're yeah. forcing me there. Yeah. And I understand you can have alternate. That's one of the questions. But 
It does seem to me that as we recognize the value of a high school education, uh, that allowing dropout at a younger age is, is problematic. So I'm interested in that, but my uh, friends uh, who are, are teachers say uh, there's a practical issues that you need to address, So, uh, and I listen to that. Well, we are only a few minutes away from having to end this, but uh, Bill from Kinnear wants to know um, what's with toll roads? He'd like to hear some more discussion about toll yeah. roads. Well, I, you know, when I, as we go back to the issue of mm -hmm. uh, my first session, again, I asked uh, for severance tax. But I said when I campaigned, when I came in office, I am open to anything that provides a predictable long-term funding stream to roads, including toll roads. I do not like toll roads. I think they're a bad thing. Uh, I don't like when you hit Wyoming, you have to hit the pay window. I don't like that notion. But I'm open to that suggestion. But the fact is, last session, uh, the legislature looked at just getting a bill forward to do a study to see whether the federal government would let us do a toll road on I-80, and that didn't even get through. So I think as a practical matter, toll roads are out for now, and I don't even know if we pass that this year, if we could even get anything going. So I think toll roads are out. Uh, again, I was open to it, even though I do not like okay. them. Uh, I, I, I like them a little better than taxes, <laughs> uh, but well, I don't like either one. If that's the case, and Bill has a second idea yeah. he wants to pop by you, why don't we have a state lottery? You remember the frenzy just a few weeks back when yeah. Powerball was up towards half billion Well, the dollars. first thing I say about the lottery is somebody would tell me the winning numbers at half a billion, I'd really be in favor of it. But here's the deal on the lottery. I, I, ha I don't have sort of just a general moral objection against it, but I do think that there is a social cost associated with it where you have a, a young man who can't support himself or his family who's spending $200 a week at the store. Well, we so, have casinos already. I mean, we've gone the opposite Well, there, of course, now on the reservation. And, and the reservation mm -hmm. and the tribes have a, mm -hmm. a right to do that. But yeah. outside that, outside the state. But uh, I'm, I'm open to it because there is not just the cost that we lose in not buying the lottery tickets here, the lottery for a dollar itself. It's that person who's driving down to uh, Fort Collins and buying the coke and the, and the fuel and maybe the dinner yeah. and the movie and all that goes with that. Uh, I, I take it that that's going to be the last word because we are pretty much out of time. Thank you, so our thanks to you, Governor Thank you, Matt Mead, and to our viewers. And if you've missed any portion of this and would like to see it again, just go to our website at wyomingpbs.org. Thanks again. Thanks, Richard. My wife went on